Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to discuss about typhoid fever. At the end of this lecture, you will be able to know what is typhoid fever, what is its pathogenesis, mood of transmission, clinical feature, features, what are the investigations you can do in typhoid fever, management, complication, and preventions. So, typhoid fever is acute infectious disease caused by Salmonella typhi or related bacteria Salm Salmonella paratyphi, which has different subtypes A and B. Both of these bacteria caused slightly different clinical presentation, but we generally call the infection by both of these typhoid fever. We also use the term enteric fever. Now the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology of enteric fever is after ingestion of contaminated food. The ingested bacilli invades, invades small intestinal mucosa. From there it is taken by macrophages and transported to the regional lymph nodes. Salmonella typhi multiply in the intestinal lymphoid tissue and also they come intact with the electrocytes and ileal pyre patches during the first to three week of incubation period. And during this period diarrhea begins. The end of the incubation period bacilli enter into the bloodstream. It is the bacteremic phase and during this phase fever begins and through the blood bacteria invade the gallbladder and biliary system and lymphatic tissue and bowel as well. Where they multiply in large number and remains there for a long period of time and then it passes out in stools. Now mode of transmission. How typhoid fever transmitted? Humans are the actually only reservoir for this type of bacteria so it has come from a human to another human. So either this can be through direct contact or indirect contact via contaminated food or water. About 1 in 20 people are asymptomatic carriers after they recover from the disease and are able to pass it on to others. In fact, you can uh, you you have heard ab uh, about typhoid Mary, a famous carrier of the typhoid bacterium who has responsible for multiple outbreaks of typhoid fever. Mary was a cook and due to improper hand washing as well as lack of knowledge about the disease, 51 typhoid cases and 3 deaths were directly attributed to her even though she herself was immune to the bacteria. So the clinical presentation of typhoid fever with the infection there is a symptoms onset occurs 10 to 14 days after ingestion of the bacteria. When the symptoms occur, it depends on the age, health, gastric acidity and number of organisms that are ingested. In the first week of infection, we have a step ladder fever with malaise. It is the first system you, symptoms you can see. Then increasing headache, drowsiness and itching in the limbs. Constipation may be caused by swelling of lymphoid tissue around the ileocecal junction and there is a relative bradycardia. The pulse is often slower than it would be expected from the height of the temperature. At the end of the second week, a rash may appear on the upper abdomen and on the back. The rashes are slightly rise which fade on pressure. Cuff and epicrexis also occur around 7 to 10 day. The spleen become palpable. At the end of the second week, complications started such as intestinal bleeding, intestinal perforation and coma death if left untreated. Investigation for typhoid fever. If you suspect typhoid fever, these are the investigation you can go with. There is WBC count, you can found relative leukopenia. Number second is uh, blood culture. Blood culture is the most important diagnostic test for typhoid. Blood culture is positive in about 80% of patients in the first two weeks of illness. It declined thereafter and about 25% patients have positive blood culture in the third week of illness. Bone marrow culture. Bone marrow culture may be positive when blood culture is negative. Culture of bone marrow spirate is 90% sensitive until at least 5 days after commencement of antibiotics. However, this technique is extremely painful which may outweigh its benefit. Stool culture, stool culture positive from second week onward and then there is PCR. PCR has been used for the diagnosis of typhoid fever with varying success. The other tests include typhoid dot test, 
this test identifies antibodies against salmonella typhi igm antibodies indicate recent infection while igg indicate remote infection the other test is vidal test the vidal test was the mainstay of typhoid fever diagnosis for decades the vidal test is no longer an acceptable clinical method now comes to the management management of typhoid fever includes nursing care bed rest diet you know maintenance of nutrition and fluid intake include in diet now treatment uh, the treatment includes ciprofloxacin 750 mg twice daily azithromycin 500 500 mg once daily this may be used if a person is unable to take ciprofloxacin or the bacteria is resistant to ciprofloxacin uh, then ciftriaxone injection 2 g iv once daily and duration of treatment is 14 days but 5 to 10 days after treatment uh 5 10 days treatment may be sufficient fever may persist for up to 5 days after the start of antibiotics treatment of carrier state ciprofloxacin 750 mg twice daily or cholecystectomy may be required for some patient symptoms go away just after they start taking the antibiotics but it's incredibly important that they finish the full course of antibiotics treatment that because the danger of typhoid fever doesn't end when the symptoms go away patient can pass the bacteria to the other people or they might develop antibiotic resistance that will make a future infection more difficult to treat now complications of typhoid fever include hemorrhages perforation cholecystitis meningitis myocarditis nephritis bone and joint infection is common in children with sickle cell anemia you can prevent typhoid fever by improve sanitation or vaccination of household contacts of a typhoid contact so that's all about typhoid fever thank you for watching this video please like subscribe and press the bell icon